Development Institute. Uh, is that enough intro? We that's, ought to have Cormac. <laughs> that's that's enough. So uh, thank you for that, uh, Cormac. Tell us tell us about your background. Thanks, Julian. So I'm calling in from Dublin. Dublin, Ireland, and uh, great to be with so many folks. I, I know that uh, there are people calling in from all around the world, so good to be together in solidarity. Uh, in terms of background, I suppose, like John said, we, uh, we've we been knocking around for about 30 years in various ways and uh, are part of a, a fraternity of people passionate and enthusiastic about that very core belief that local communities uh, are full and abundant with all kinds of treasures. So over the last 30 years or so, I've spent a lot of time in communities around the world, just really getting alongside them and trying to understand what it means to think about change from inside out. And John's been uh, really a deep friend and obviously uh, a very important mentor. So a couple of years now, uh, I think just at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought we should sit down and write a report from the field, given that we were sequestered for a little while due to the uh, the pandemic. And uh, really the connected community is the output of that musing and, and, and those reports. So that book is our report card so far. Oh, good. Well, you, I, you obviously get gold stars for it, you know. <laughs> so, um... So how did you start along this path? Because um, in many, many areas of the world have not forgotten what community is, but many areas have. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, rediscovering this sense of community. How did all that happen and uh, how did you find your way with it? John, would you like to kick off with that one? Well, it's... Um rather obscure <laughs> source, but uh, I had been involved for about 20 years with all kinds of neighborhood groups in the Chicago area. And I went, uh, I was then appointed uh, to the faculty of a major university here, Northwestern University. And when I got here, I looked at all of the research about community that our scholars were doing. And what I found was a very strange thing. Almost all community research was about what's missing, what are its problems, and what's wrong. The empty half of a glass, right? Now, that uh, and that comes out in practice in saying, well, if we want to be useful in a local place, what we need to do is a needs survey. That is to find out what's wrong, what isn't there, right? And uh, uh, we thought when we realized that in academia, that was almost the exclusive approach to local neighborhoods, that somebody ought to do some research about what is there that people have done that have made things better, and what are the what are the resources they use when they make things better, and did uh, nobody in the university thought of people in a neighborhood as producers? As people, they always thought people in neighborhoods were clients, right? And incidentally, client uh, comes from a Greek root, which means somebody on their back, reclining, right? So that this academic passive assumption about neighborhoods just was so stark that we decided to do a four year study of what was there rather than what wasn't there, right? And the result of that was several thousand, believe it or not, stories in which people were telling what they did with what was there. And we summarized that 
in I think the in the U.S. the best selling guide to neighborhood development, which is called Building Communities from the Inside Out, a pathway to the assets in your community. And so that was published 30 years ago and uh, has been used all over the world. And we've gotten a lot of feedback and a learning from people who are taking this asset-based approach. And uh, so at the end of that 30 years, uh, Cormac and I <clears throat> said, uh, in a sense, what have we learned? We know a lot more now than we did 30 years ago when we put out the first guide. And so this book is what we have learned since we first published the, the, the book, Building Communities from the Inside Out. But it incorporates a lot more stories uh, that help people understand the orientation and the practice of an asset-based development strategy. And I think it gives a much more uh, useful progression of activities for people who want to go further in this direction. So it's uh, volume two. <laughs> of the asset-based approach to community development. Excellent. Thank you. And Cormac, how did you get enrolled in all of this? Well, for me, I think the very start of it, awareness around kids in care and the Irish context um, and other people who were institutionalized being taken out of very big institutions and then being put into neighborhoods, but not being of those neighborhoods, you know. So in the early 70s, hearing people talk about community care, which in effect was that that act of taking people out of big institutions, particularly kids, and putting them into care homes or residential centers in the neighborhood, and realizing that while we were calling it community care, there was neither community nor care in what was being done. And recognizing that you can't program that, you can't prescribe that. So I began back in the early 90s being really curious about who was doing really grounded instead of abstract concrete work in neighborhoods to do something that would enable that sense of caring, that sense of connection, that sense of welcome, particularly for people who had lost their home or were, you know, seeking to reclaim their citizenship if they were coming from another country in distress or trauma. And it really struck me that certainly in the Irish context at that point, what I was seeing was a lot of therapeutic ways of working with individuals, but not a lot of bridge building between what I saw as the gifts and the contributions of those individuals and the potential in the neighborhoods themselves that they were moving into. So they were really, I suppose, they were being treated as though they were a problem to be fixed. And help in that those early days was about sympathy rather than real genuine compassion. So it was very much about therapy. The professional dealt with the person with the problem and the only thing that was really different was we were in smaller buildings and they weren't as gray and you know they were in a neighborhood rather than being in nowhere places at the edge of communities but what was really striking is those people were as isolated and as removed and as lonely and as disconnected and as serviced as their forebears before them the only thing was we just moved the language around a little bit and John's work was the work that struck me as most authentic to genuine grassroots community building. So I reached out and we became friends. And so, so and, and, and um, there's, there's an element of this where, you know, when you, when you approach people with a service delivery mindset, 
that what you're doing is you're defining them by their needs and their weaknesses and by the things that are wrong. And, and who wants to be judged by all the things that are wrong with us, you know? I mean, the list is long, let's be fair. And, uh, but it's much yeah. nicer to think about, um, about the good aspects of things. But it would be really good to hear um, the, uh, what you mean by uh, assets and community assets, uh, because it, uh, uh, assets are normally kind of, thought about in the context of uh, material goods or wealth or whatever but what do you mean by by assets john do you want to pitch in on that okay well we have uh, <clears throat> we we looked at a uh, thousand stories at least from about two thousand stories in which People were telling us from neighborhoods what they had done to make the neighborhood better. Not what were the issues or problems, but what they had done in the neighborhood to make things better. And so we collected those stories and then asked ourselves, what do they use when they make things better? What are the building blocks of a neighborhood that is productive rather than a client of outside institution. And it became rather clear that there were six basic building blocks. And let me go over them very quickly. Uh, the first was the gifts and talents of the local residents, the most important single asset. The second is the gathering together of <clears throat> the people who live in the neighborhood and create connected associations that allow their individual voices to be much louder because they are in association with others of the same voice in a sense. The third asset is the local institutions that appear in the neighborhood. This is not the, the big groups or the downtown groups. It's the, the library, the fire station, uh, the, uh, the local manifestation of institutions that are in place and themselves connected, right? The third, a fourth asset is the physical environment. It's a huge asset if you look at it as a point of production with a calling to you to say, this is our place. How do we celebrate it? How do we multiply? And the uh, fifth <coughs> is exchange or connection. That is the first four assets become activated by connecting them. So the connection process and connecting people and connectors are at the heart of the action that grows out of an asset-based approach. And the last, the sixth, uh, is uh, culture. That is the way that develops so that people become working parts together in making the neighborhood a sustainable sustainable set of relationships that allow productivity to occur. So it's those six assets that are in almost every neighborhood. Uh, we, uh, we get uh, contacted by people from all over the world, unlikely places who see those six as uh, where they are. That surrounds them. So an asset-based approach to community says this is the center. 
these six resources and the key to their being mobilized is connection. And that's why the title of the book right, has the word connection, the connected community as key, right? Assets don't do, are, are not something that uh, work very well or at all unless they're connected to each other. And so the action that we uh, um, assist people with has to do with how do you connect? So Cormac, you want to add to that? So, so I'm going to I'm going to get you to refine that a bit. Thank you for that, John. Uh, um, so there's um, people connect in all sorts of ways, and sometimes it's healthy, and sometimes it's really unhealthy. Um, but um, but one of the things about connecting in a, in a way that enhances community is that the the outcomes of this are are deep and profound in so many different directions. So, what is it that you do? that helps people to connect in a healthy way? Marmika. Yeah, I think, I think like John says, the first, the first probably the most important thing is to remind people that they and their neighbors are enough, that they matter. So sometimes it's the act of remembering, both in terms of recalling the value of each other and the value of leaning into our relationships at the local level with each other, with our associations, with the built environment, the economy and culture. So, so that's, that's really important because a lot of modern life puts us in a situation where we have very little gas left in the tank when we get home, except maybe for ourselves and our family. But the idea that it's worthwhile being neighborly, connecting with the immediate things that are a couple of door knocks away is is becoming increasingly uh, an uncommon thought. So one of the things we can help people do is think about where they place value in life on on their own gifts and the gifts of their neighbors that may be overlooked. And we think talking to a lot of people around the world that their report to us is that you know modern life is like a meat grinder. It kind of pulls them in and. Uh, leaves them pretty ragged at the end. And there are a lot of people that are moving through their neighborhoods like tourists on a tour bus with the blinds pulled across. So they're not really discovering what's there. Now, you can't connect something unless you first discover. And then you've got to discover it's of value. And then you've got to recover it. And then you've got to be prepared to do something to not be distracted as you're recovering it, right? So there's there are a lot of different things. So the first part of the book is actually a process of discovery and rediscovering that our good life is not in the marketplace, but it's actually much closer to home within and uh, you know surrounding our home places. So I think that's the first piece. It's advocating for that uh, very uh, local, that very personal and that very associational view that everybody in our neighborhood including you and me, and particularly the people who've been labeled, particularly the people who feel uh, pushed to the edge. We're saying, we see you for your gift and we cannot do life without you. So I think that becomes a very, very healing, cathartic message for people who may otherwise be feeling like cannon fodder for the marketplace. And, and when you're talking about gifts, give us some examples of the kind of gifts that are kind of powerful in the context of community. Why don't you do that, Chad? Uh, <clears throat> let's go to your neighbor's house, knock on the door and introduce ourselves. Hopefully we know that person. But if we don't, we introduce ourselves as being one of several people on this block or in this neighborhood who believe there are an awful lot of talented people. And if we could get th that talent activated, this would be a better neighborhood. So can I ask you about your talent? And uh, let's see, 
Can you tell me what are the most significant gifts that you have? Well, I never thought about that. Well, let's see. Uh, what do you have any gifts related to children? Oh yes, yes. I uh, I'm able to to teach children how to work with wood. Uh, in the neighborhood, have you ever done anything that uh, helped things along? Well, at, at uh, Christmas time. I did uh, begin to get people to say, let's decorate every house here so that we are a celebratory neighborhood. Any other gifts that you have? Well, uh, I've been able to get people together to do things here. So now I'm I'm stepping away from the, that process, but here is this person's gifts, three, three of them, all potentially useful individually and collectively. And then I would I would I won't do it. I would ask them uh, what are their skills? That is things they were not born with, but that they learn. And uh, <clears throat> third, <clears throat> um, let's see, Cormac, help me on the third. Uh, yeah, so exactly. No, John, you're 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 in the flow now. So it's it's the skills what we're born with, the the gifts which really come. I mean, in a sense, the skills we learn over time, but they the gifts are the things that we're born with there are innate capacities but also people have passions things they're not they might not be particularly gifted with or maybe even skilled at but they care enough to show up anyway so they've got a passion so also i think people have knowledge and experience sometimes experiences they've lived through and come out the other side but people's skills their talents their passions and their experience and knowledge in life they're all entry points within which you're going to find somebody has a story if you tease it out. And if you ask them to share about each of those categories, you'll discover their story will tell you what their gifts are if you pay enough time and attention. So if you do this on, on your own block, you're going to find that most people, if you ask them about those four talents, will will give you on average three of each. So if four times three is 12. So you're looking at a person with four, with 12 special talents. And then you ask, would you be willing to share those with other people in the block? And we know that 90% of the people will say, sure, I, I'd, I'd be happy to. And so for all of the people who are listening, right, why would we have a book about connection? When you walk to your front porch or outside your apartment today, Look both ways. If you live in a house, look both ways. There are 30 houses there. There are, you can bet on it, at least 12 talents, gifts, skills in each of those. Now, do a little uh, help me. What is 12 times 30? Who could, uh, either you, uh, around about around about 360 or somewhere near there anyway okay now you're right so but what i'm trying to get your listeners to see is when you walk out a door of any house in a neighborhood or apartment you are inundated inundated with people 
with talents that they are waiting to give. And that's why the book is about a connected community, because that giving won't happen unless some people on the block decide, I'll work together with a few other people on beginning the connections that we can make here between these people. And here on this block, we got 360 gems, right? <laughs> I've just opened the treasure chest of a neighborhood. What mm. are we going to do? Can we make a string of pearls now? Because I want to make this as practical as possible on your block. It is very likely that there are people sitting there with 300 plus talents waiting to give them. And why would anybody go to a neighborhood like that and say, let's do a needs survey. Let's <laughs> find out what's wrong with them, right? But that's what mo almost all professionals do, right? So an asset-based approach says, we are surrounded by an incredible, incredible bank <laughs> of talent let's try in there using them mm. yeah yeah and the, and the two key pieces there julian are that when people recognize number one that there is a reservoir of treasure waiting to be discovered and number two that the only way we'll discover that is by going out and asking, having that conversation. I think that's an incredible incentive, not to everybody, but there are people we know in neighborhoods who, when they hear that, are attracted, that they find that information fetching. And we call those people connectors. So in their nature, just the same way as if I played a violin and I had another one on the table, there would be a resonance between the two chords. When we say, hey, do you know that there is a bundle of neighborhoods on, you know, connectors and whatnot and relationships and possibilities and passions in this neighborhood waiting for a conversation? They'll go, ah, OK. And increasingly, what we find is that people find that inv invitation as connectors quite fetching. They're taking the book, whether it's by reading it as a group, uh, you know, as a person themselves, and they're taking really simple ideas forward and changing the nature of the conversation that they're having with their neighbors, with the clubs and with the groups. Because the difficulty sometimes is if you're living in a neighborhood where you've got lots of very smart, you know, well-resourced expert people coming in who start the conversation in a certain way, sometimes you internalize that. You start thinking, oh, maybe that's the way things are meant to be done around here. Maybe we're supposed to focus on what's wrong instead of what's strong. So in a sense, we're contesting that story and we're putting out another version, <laughs> which is very much grounded in reality. And we're just inviting people to go knock on a few doors and see if what we're saying is true. And invariably, when people take that risk, they discover it's so. So, uh, so um, one of the one of the challenging things about what you're saying is that uh, often, you know, like you're saying, services define themselves by identifying needs and and um, meeting those needs because it gives us service value and meaning. But implied in all of that, which is quite a tricky thing, and uh, and who knows where this comes from, uh, is power relationships. In other words, that um, that it, when services come in and say this is how things are done, then community can often disappear. So part of the problem is dismantling those power relationships. And and I know you addressed that to, uh, in uh, rekindling democracy, which was kind of aimed at, as a court one of Cormac's previous books, which is kind of aimed at uh, saying, look, you know, we can renegotiate those power relationships so that services can appreciate communities but now you've got this book which in my mind uh, where you describe what a connected community is and that you shape it in terms of 
the practical ways in which individuals and communities can come together to start to discover these things themselves. So would you like to just to give us a kind of a uh, overview of uh, how that functions and how people can read the book and put it to practical use? Marmy? Yeah, just briefly, and John chime in then. It, I suppose the book is structured to be very, very much like a compass, Julian. So there, there are three basic phases, if you like, that we're suggesting people might want to be curious around and pay some attention to. So that first phase is discovery. So going out and actually really connecting at the level with what's there and just discovering it. Community walks, having conversations, whatnot. Once there's clarity around uh, the discovery of the assets, it's much easier then to figure out with your neighbors what you might want to do to make that string of pearls that uh, John was describing. And that's the second phase. That's the connecting piece. So John earlier on listed the six building blocks or assets. They're in every neighborhood. They're useful. They're universal. Uh, they're really simple. But the, the issue is not that they're missing. The issue is, is that they're not connected yet. And the idea is that after we go through a process of discovery, we're in a much better position to collectivize around that conversation about how might we bring these assets into a relationship that's flourishing for ourselves, our neighbors, and our local environment, economy, and cultures. So that, that, that's the quest, the second phase. The third phase, after you've discovered, you've connected, the question is, so now we have all kinds of flourishing relationships, but what might we want to do with those? How might we want to mobilize and move forward? So how do we take these into flourishing, sustained, and enduring action over time? So that we're, we're not just taking on lots and lots of projects and connecting people for the sake of doing things, but we're actually growing a culture, a way of being in the world. That much, I suppose, in the way that indigenous wisdom would teach us about the importance of thinking seven generations hence, for example. So it's that question of how do we endure? And I think at that moment, we're mobilizing not alone in our own lifetime, but mobilizing to be in right relationship with everything that surrounds us. And that's the third dimension. So that can be mobilizing towards a vision, uh, towards culture. It, it, it involves action. And sometimes it may also be about mobilizing to change the power relationships. So I think what we often find is as people go through the phase of, of discovering, hey, there's a lot around here when we remove the labels that have been put on us that we can be very proud of. And it's very, very important for a good life. And you know what, if we put these things together in a democratic way, they amplify and they multiply those possibilities, but they won't sustain unless we keep mobilizing, we keep the intentionality, we figure out how to endure and create a culture that sustains. And so it, it feels to me that those three phases uh, or stages are really, re they're useful hooks, I suppose, that people at local level can you know, just connect into and feel a sense of direction around. But I wouldn't want to suggest they're a map or a, a paint by numbers approach. <laughs> it's what I think we're giving people as a compass rather than a map. And we're encouraging them to then play with those and experiment, explore and learn to trust their instincts and their neighbors as they go. So, uh, uh, John, do you want to add to that at all? Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So, so um, uh, I, yeah, I know both of you have been all over the world and, and Cormac, you've done practically nothing but go all over the world. And you've seen <laughs> this in north to south, east to west, up and down, you know, whichever way. And what do you find about um, uh, the different cultures? And um, the, uh, there's a there's a there's a uh, it's not painting by numbers. Um, but it's local cultures and these principles about discovering these principles in local cultures. Would you like just to tell us about, you know, the wide variety of places that you visited and how that's uh, 
how, how it works in those very different places. Because we have a question, um, which is the barriers, differences, i.e. culture to uh, connecting need to be identified. And, and what we're saying is what I'm getting at is the local nature you know, of your neighborhood, your next neighborhood, or your neighborhood in North Alaska, you know, uh, how does it function in different places? So I'll, I'll say a few words, but I'm, I'm keen on hearing John's reflections on this as well, because we do hear, uh, particularly now at a time of polarization, and, and, you know, the complexity of celebrating diversity in local places to the backdrop of, of, of quite a lot of uh, challenges. I suppose what strikes me is in different parts of the world that I've been in is that to varying degrees, you'll hear people say, I've just come back from Singapore, where if you go into many of the local neighborhoods, you'll hear expressions like uh, pong, pong, pong spirit or, you know, go tong rayong, which means to give without expectation of return. Um, and I think uh, that really strikes me wherever I go. So in, in our Irish Celtic tradition, we have language and words that are about we instead of me. We have language and words that are about celebrating Mother Nature. Um, I do a lot of work, as you know, and I know you do too, Julian, and, and, and John does as well, with First Nations and First Peoples around the world, and the Indigenous connection to, to, on, to being on country, to land, to the Great Spirit, to that sense of interdependence. So I think in those cultures, when we talk about what we're talking about, they will simply say, yes, that's how we live our lives, or yes, that, 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 that's our way. Now, there are other um, cultures, perhaps, that are more influenced by media. <laughs> and um, perhaps you might say, in a sense, where there is more of a culture of me, um, less of a culture of Ubuntu, more of a culture of Frank Sinatra doing it his way. And <laughs> in that context, I think people will hear what we're saying and it might sound a bit pie in the sky, or it might sound like we're looking back, uh, you know, with rose tinted glasses to ancient times. But there's a middle way. It's interesting that in between those two extremes, if you actually go anywhere in the world and you say to people in a neighborhood at street level or in a village, where people gather up maybe outside of the school where parents are dropping their kids or where people walk in the park. Do you live around here? And if, if somebody says yes, say, do you know anybody around here? And they say, yeah, a few people. Say, do you know any stories about a time that locals around here got together to make things better? And I think if you stayed for two or three days and you just ping pong between all of those stories, you would find a culture that's just waiting to be appreciated and it might be gasping for air it may not be as vibrant and as expressive as you know some of the the cultures that i i referenced earlier but it's there waiting to be birthed waiting to be called forth and in a sense what's missing is the curation of all of those disparate stories but they're there in every community so i think one of the things we need to do if we're interested in honoring uh, community life is instead of going around and asking people their opinions about, you know, the latest uh, political rows or, you know, uh, their opinions about what's happening on Wall Street, it's to really begin the conversation about what's happening on their street and to be really thoughtful about keeping it in a narrative where they can tell you rather than you telling them. So we don't want to moralize, you know, the gospel of inclusion or the gospel of EDI or diversity, but no, can you tell us where you're seeing the islands of inclusion? And yes, of course, there will be fault lines. And yes, of course, there will be baggage and there will be trauma. And sometimes there will be worse than that, but there will always be possibility. And what we're calling people's attention to is to hearing, seeing, appreciating, getting, you know, switching on our senses to those stories and beginning to ask, how do we get more of those? And how, in the process of doing that, 
How do we welcome the stranger at the edge? You say not everybody is included yet. Well, based on what I've heard you say, how might we do more? And I think that's the process, which is much more inside out. I certainly don't think we're going to get it by sensitizing people or preaching at them. So certainly from our perspective, that ground up approach has worked very, very well around the world. And uh, John, there's a, I want to ask you specifically about this because there's a there's a deeply profound message in all of this, which is about what does wealth mean, and uh, and culturally, you know, particularly in uh, in first world nations, that um, that wealth is often taken to mean material possessions or power or things that you have. And, and by implication, what you're saying is that's not wealth, that's oh. often separation. Yeah. And so, so uh, you've discovered the richness of connection in community and how people discover that richness themselves. But can you tell us about a different version of what wealth is? How about a story? <laughs> Perfect. Uh, which is which is our way <laughs> of uh, sharing, right? Um, thinking about one of, our, one of the stories we, we ran across, this is in an urban neighborhood in the United States. We knocked on the door and a woman came to the door. Uh, her name was Mrs. Lane. And uh, we asked her about uh, what the, uh, have been going on in the neighborhood and what were her gifts and talents and had they done anything together? And she says, oh yes. She says, you know, a couple of years ago, my daughter became a teenager and she, I think, joined together with the teenage girl next door. And during their first summer as teenagers, they started walking down the wrong path. I could see it. And so I thought, how can we do something to keep them off that path? And she said, I went next door and I talked to the mother of the other teenage girl. And she, uh, she said, well, you know, Maybe there are some things here that we can get them to do this summer, right? There will be a different path. And so uh, they got together six more mothers with teenage girls and brought them to a discussion of what could be done by the girls that would be a good path. And then she said, well, the first thing that we did was we have a lot of businesses around here. And so we contacted the business people. We knew a lot of them and said, we have a lot of girls who would like to know about your kind of business. And so she said, they all agreed. They liked to show off, right? And so we took the girls to banks and to insurance companies and to restaurants and to clothing stores. And it made them have a completely different understanding of what the possibilities for vo vocation might be because they all only knew about Beyonce and, and, and other media figures that they could aspire to. But they could aspire to an economic world right here. And then she said, that made us think that we have a lot of people in the neighborhood that various of us know who are artistic. So they began to organize days when various artists from the neighborhood would come and spend with the girls, sharing their artistic abilities and getting them involved in this, right? And uh, 
So actually, she said the three of these girls are now apprenticing with artists. And uh, she said, then we wanted the girls to do something to make the neighborhood better. And she said, uh, they came up with the idea of making a flag for each house that had symbols on it that represented that family. And so they got some material and they began to interview people about their history and to talk about what would be symbols and they would sew that on and then one Saturday when everybody had a flag every household came out and put the flag out in front their family flag and told everybody else on the block why those symbols were and what our history is now, Mrs. Lane is a connector. And Mrs. Lane said to us at that time, she said, you know, we have broken the lines between mothers. We have broken the lines between mothers and daughters. We have now gotten a similar initiative for boys. So we have broken the lines between boys, fathers, mothers, daughters. And we are a real community now because the lines that kept us disconnected have all been broken. <laughs> now, now imagine, the vocational changes, the artistic possibilities, the community development sense of everybody having a flag, all that developed with nothing from the outside at all. I have just told you a story where only the assets of the people in that neighborhood were used or recognized, discovered, and connected. And when you begin to see that kind of world, just doing all of that builds more and more relations. And they're strong relationships because they aren't just talking, they're doing too. Uh, yeah, and um, uh, there's a comment from Marilyn uh, from Charter for Compassion here who says it reminds her of a project she experienced of villages in India where people created their village museums. They created history of their community and collected items that amplified their stories. Often these village museums were kept in a shoebox, which is exactly <laughs> what you're saying. That's and great. It, it, uh, that's perfect. And um, uh, And the book book I think explains this beautifully and and gives people practical ways in which they can read the book and feel inspired to go out into their community to start this process of discovering the community treasures and and um, uh, and for me definitely I want to live in a neighborhood where there are treasures rather than people <laughs> working out what's wrong um, <laughs> how would you suggest people pick up the book and start using it can Mark? i just say julian just it's important to say here that uh, we're not talking about everybody rushing into their neighborhood and turning their back on the outside world and and you know this isn't about uh self-sufficiency it's about self-reliance uh, other reliance so there is a piece where we're recognizing there are an incredible abundant set of possibilities that are available in our neighborhood to be discovered, connected and mobilized. But we can't do everything in our neighborhood. The point is we can't know what we need from outside our neighborhood until we know what we can do together within our neighborhood. So that's a really important point to make. So it does feel really important as we come to the end of this to say, we are able to be in a much stronger position to speak with, and indeed we have a whole chapter about auditioning useful outsiders, so we can form mutual coalition. 
with folks who want to stand in some kind of a supplementary role with us and say, hey, we've got assets within our institution. We are not interested in taking a monopoly over your health or your education or your safety. We recognize you are health producers, you are safety producers. So there's a whole section in the book where we talk about communities having functions. And if we collectivize and join together, we have work to do, which will absolutely transform our lives and will put us in a much better position to be a mutual alliance with outside uh, resources and institutions. So it's just to make that point. We're not against uh, institutions, but if we're going to be in right relationship, we've got to make change happen from inside out, not outside in. And that's about starting with what's strong locally and then beginning to open that out. People are doing all kinds of different things, Julian, uh, to uh, get into the book. We have uh, heard a lot of stories about folks who are just simply buying the book uh, in groups of five, six or seven and reading the book and then taking it chapter by chapter because the book kind of steps you out uh, on a couple of uh, ideas per chapter, two or three ideas that you could just go try with your neighbours. We're also hearing stories about practitioners who want to work differently and serve differently in the neighborhood. And they're using the book for their own practice, but also with the people they serve to trigger a conversation. Um, there are also people I think who are just using the book as an excuse to have a conversation and probably don't read the book at all. Uh, and that's that's <laughs> great too. Um, so I, I think in a sense, the book is almost an excuse to bring people into relationship uh, where we don't feel odd about the idea of talking about the neighborhood as being a, a, ma a matter of our business. And I think increasingly that's what we're hearing people say. It's so refreshing to hear stories and to share stories with our neighbors that are not just about us as individuals or about our jobs, but are, you know, about our work at the neighborhood level. So it's, um, it's hard to, we don't want to prescribe how to use the book. Uh, we're, we're just enjoying hearing people coming back to us and telling us what they're doing. There is one practical thing that we're hearing, or two practical things we're hearing a lot of people do. One is there's a game at the end of the book that a lot of folks are coming back and saying they enjoy called the We Can Game. And uh, they're just printing that out and playing that with people of all age groups. And that just focuses in on people's strengths. And the other is there's a reader's guide that's a few pages long. And what it does is it offers prompt questions. So as you're reading the book, if you want to get together with your neighbors and chat through a couple of guided questions, that's there at the back of the book. And I would suggest even if you haven't read the book, <clears throat> if you ask each other those questions, you'll find that you'll get a lot of worth and, and benefit from that. And, and um, Marilyn has joined us. I'm going to see if Marilyn's got a question in a second. Um, uh, the last point I wanted to make is that often, you know, that we label communities as deprived or hard pressed or um, a whole variety of other names. But often in the context of uh, what you might call what Robert Putnam called social capital, in other words, the community treasures that you often find that in those communities, they are full of treasures, which are there, which are shared and nourished. And, and this is not something that is a wealthy person's domain. We all have these treasures. So uh, look, it's been, uh, I'm gonna hand over to Marilyn in a second. It's been such a pleasure to have a conversation with you. And thank you for describing this all so incredibly clearly with lots of lovely examples and long may it continue <laughs> i wish we had uh, another hour and john i remember your name because i was a principal on the west side in chicago oh. um, many years ago but it was at a time where um a, a person by the name of jerry miller dr jerry miller uh, who was in charge of the detention center for youth came to my school, which was just a block away and said, how would you like to have 120 uh, new students to the school? 
Uh, and because, you know, these kids are in school here at Audie Home on, uh, on Chicago's West Side, and that's their whole life. And maybe they could come to the school. And it was an incredible experience. Um, and it created a new neighborhood uh, within a non-neighborhood, actually. Oh. I wish I would have had uh, what you are presenting in your book right now, uh, because I think we would have maybe gotten even a lot further in the work we were doing, because we needed to go beyond uh, what we were doing, because it was pretty much a, um, a concrete village. Um, and and there are a couple questions here that I, I know that it would take some uh, remarkable time to do. Uh, do. Um, justice to but thank you so much for doing this and um boy it would be interesting to have a repeat conversation with some of our uh compassionate cities uh with teams of people um marge andre who has uh given us a few questions here uh from canada and um i'm wondering if you'd be open to having a chat uh, like maybe in August or September, where we just kind of continued this uh, and invited people in a circle to to continue talking. Uh, this was wonderful. And thank you again. And I'm going to turn it back over to Felipe, who has just a few things to help wrap this up. Yes, absolutely. What is, what is your name? Uh, my name is Marilyn Turkovich. Ah, okay. Marilyn, uh, Marilyn leads the Charter for Compassion. Uh, Marilyn is our boss, yes. <laughs> so thank you so much again for this presentation. I just wanted to give everyone a few announcements. Our or our next upcoming course is Growing Whole Not Old, Aging Wisely with Deborah Briggs. This is a popular course that has been in our roster for the last couple of years. It begins on June 12th and it's for four weeks. Um, we also have our Ednet Forum with Compassion Matters. Uh, it's a project from the Dalai Lama Center. And this will be on Thursday, June 15th at 7.30 a.m. Pacific time. And next we have this Saturday, we have the Charter Sangha, which is a space for us to take meditation and space and um, gather together in a, in a safe environment where we can meditate and take a breath. And this happens every last Saturday of the month. And so this Saturday, the 27th. And our next global read is with Imam Jamal Rahman. And um, we're going to have our guest, uh, Pastor John McKenzie and Rabbi Laura Duran Kaplan, who are going to be the facilitators of this global read with the book Sacred Laughter of the Sufis. Do not miss that. Thank you, everyone, once again for uh, joining us and for your support. And we hope that we'll join us again soon for our next upcoming global read. Thank you, everyone, again. Thanks, Felipe.